Hi students, this is your mini lecture for the end of the war in Europe and also the war in the Pacific. When we left off in Europe, the Allies had opened a second front in France uh, as well as secured the Italian and African fronts and Russia was approaching Berlin from the east. The Allies uh, Great Britain, France, and the United States were making their final push towards Germany in 1944, uh, and they had been very successful in this. Uh, and in the meantime, Germany was straining to keep up with their war production. Allied forces uh, made significant gains in France and freed it from Nazi occupation. Um, ultimately, the war would come down to the Battle of the Bulge, which took place on December 16, 1944, until the 25th of January, 1945. It was the last major German offensive and an attempt to break the Allied momentum and to um, reinvade France, if at all possible, if they broke the Allied lines and defeated their armies. Uh, however, the battle gets its name from the way the Allied line bulged out, but never broke. Uh, ultimately, the Allied forces defeated the Germans, uh, and Hitler would commit suicide shortly thereafter, uh, as USSR troops reached Berlin and took the city. Uh, so that concludes the war in Europe. Uh, so we're going to shift now to our war in the Pacific. And remember that these battles were all happening at the same time. It wasn't that Hitler died and then the United States went to the Pacific. Um, so we'll talk about that timeline. When we left off in the Pacific, Japan had struck at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, and the U.S. Pacific Fleet had been severely damaged in the process. Uh, however, the Japanese attack was on a much larger scale than just Pearl Harbor. While Pearl Harbor happened, the Japanese launched simultaneous attacks on the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, Midway Island, Hong Kong, Thailand, and British Malaya. Uh, and I'll show you on a map in a moment just where all those places are. Um, famously in the Philippines, General Douglas MacArthur, who would head up the Pacific Fleet, uh, said, I shall return as the U.S. troops were forced to retreat from the Philippines uh, in light of the Japanese attack. Uh, so here on this map, you can see all of the places I just mentioned. Uh, up here near Hawaii are the Midway Islands. Uh, slightly farther south and west is Wake Island. And then Guam and the Philippines. And you can see how those islands make a nice line down to the Philippines. Uh, and this was a way for U.S. ships to refuel at each station uh, before making the next leg of the journey. Uh, that's part of the reason the Japanese took those islands, was to disrupt U.S. supply lines, um, and also to make it more difficult for the U.S. to cross the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you can see the other places they took, Malaysia and Thailand, are part of this peninsula over here to the south of China, and this was a strategic area for global shipping and trade, uh, and it would also help the Japanese uh, to gather more resources. And over here you can see is Hong Kong uh, in southern China, and this was an important trading port. Uh, the next year, in 1942, the Japanese would continue their expansion, capturing Borneo, Burma, the Dutch East Indies, several of the Aleutian Islands, which are part of Alaska, and Singapore. And I'm going to go back to the previous map and show you where all of those are located at. Uh, Borneo is this large island in Indonesia over here. Um, Burma is up here next to India, again near that Southeast Asia, Thailand region. Uh, the Dutch East Indies are the rest of what today is known as Indonesia, a series of islands, uh, and again those major trading routes, and the Japanese were really trying to consolidate their grip on this whole Southeast Asian region. Uh, Singapore is right here on the tip of Malaysia, it's an independent city-state. Um, and it was kind of the crown jewel of British power in Asia. And the Aleutian Islands are way up here at the north. You can see they took some of the tip here. Um, but Singapore was a really big deal because, in addition to being embarrassing for the British, it shattered the myth of European invincibility in Asia. 
And in February of 1942, when they succeeded in, the Japanese succeeded in taking Singapore, um, they touted this whole conquest as uh, taking Asia for the Asians. And Japan kind of positioned itself as the leader of Asia uh, in an independence movement from Europe imperialism. And this was very important, and initially uh, this was really well received uh, in Asia by countries um, that were in this region. And Japan said that its goal was to create a greater East Asian crow pro prosperity sphere, where they would be able to um, increase trade and economics free of the interference of the European governments that had um, dominated their economies and political structures for so long. Uh, and as I said before, this was well received at first. However, as the Japanese continued their bloody conquests and brutal occupations uh, in this region, that sentiment quickly faded. Um, and it became clear that when the Japanese said Asia for the Asians, what they really meant was Asia for the Japanese. Um, in June of 1942, the United States began the long process of uh, retaking the Pacific Islands and making their way to Japan. In June of 1942, there's the Battle of Midway, which is, was a crucial turning point in the Pacific Campaign, uh, and it started the strategy of island hopping, uh, which was a strategy of taking strategically placed islands so that the U.S. fleet would be able to move across the Pacific Ocean and to eventually strike at Japan itself. Um, remember that at this time the technology is not what we have today and that to successfully bomb a country and that you obviously have to go there and come back um, and just the engines were not efficient enough uh, or the fuel tanks not large enough that these bombers could really go super long distances like they can today. Um, so in this island hopping campaign, the fighting uh, involved taking the island over, and this fighting was deadly to the last man uh, on these heavily fortified islands. After the Japanese took control in the early 1940s, they immediately began fortifying them with concrete bunkers and secret tunnel systems and using the natural caves in many of these islands uh, as supply depots, stocking up on food, ammunition, weapons, uh, anything they might need to resist an invasion of these islands. Uh, in 1944, the United States retook the Marianas Islands, including Guam, uh, as well as the Philippines. So if you go back to that map, you'll see they had gotten most of the way across the Pacific, but they were still fairly far south of Japan. Um, and 1945 would be the year that um, really sticks out in American cultural memory uh, for two battles, the battle for Iwo Jima and the battle for Okinawa. Many of you have probably seen the famous statue of the Americans raising the flag over Iwo Jima. Um, but what I'm going to take time to talk about for a little bit is Okinawa. Uh, there were two months of fighting in this battle, and this is where uh, the United States first saw, really, the mass use of kamikaze pilots. Um, we all know that there had been kamikazes earlier. Uh, however, during these two months, there were over 1,900 kamikaze missions uh, aimed at destroying U.S. ships uh, and stopping the United States from being able to carry out this assault. Um, and ultimately, 110,000 civilians would be dead, uh, some from bombings by the U.S., but most of those civilians died resisting U.S. forces. Uh, they fought to the bitter end, really, uh, to stop the United States, or try to stop the United States from taking Okinawa. Uh, and the reason for this are many and complicated, but uh, we've talked about propaganda before, and the Japanese had proven to be just as adept at making propaganda as uh, the U.S. or any European power had, and the Japanese uh, had convinced their civilian population that if American troops captured Japan, uh, or captured any civilians, uh, they would be treated in ways that were not so different from what the Japanese did to the Chinese at Nanking. Uh, 
And um, so the Japanese were terrified that the United States would uh, capture their women and children, uh, their families, and so they were really fighting to the death to protect those people. And the civilians that died fighting U.S. forces were afraid of what would happen to them if the United States won. Um, an e example of the depth, I guess, of fear that uh, the Japanese people were experiencing was that uh, even as late as the 1990s, in the Pacific Ocean there were small islands where survivors of World War II were being found after having been abandoned and lost radio contact and lost really all contact with the world, uh, still thinking that World War II was going on. Um, and these are I'm, men in their 80s and 90s in many cases uh, who were waiting for the American attack to come to their island. Uh, so that just shows you the, the kind of commitment that the Japanese had towards this war. Um, ultimately, though, the United States would make its way close enough to Japan uh, to be able to attack it. And this began uh, with high-altitude bombing strikes against major cities and industrial areas, much as had been done in Europe. Um, the firebombing of Tokyo was the uh, most destructive event uh, to this point, and Tokyo was firebombed in March of 1945, and 25% of the city had burned, and more than 100,000 people died in the process. Um, this was on scale with many of the cities that had been destroyed in Europe and elsewhere in Asia uh, in World War II, and just one atrocity among many. Um, but the firebombing of Tokyo did not break the Japanese spirit, and they vowed to continue resisting the United States. And it was at this point that President Truman had to make a decision. Um, and that decision was whether or not the United States should attempt a land invasion of Japan uh, and to try to capture the country that way and end the war. Um, or the other option was to drop uh, the untested atomic bombs on um, onto Japan to see if that would uh, scare the Japanese into surrendering without the loss of US lives that a land invasion would cost. And Truman's generals predicted that the cost in American and Japanese lives uh, would be even higher than any other battles that had been fought during World War II. Uh, and just the Japanese and their unwillingness to surrender uh, ultimately led Truman to decide that the uh, atomic bomb needed to be dropped. Uh, the city of Hiroshima was the first city uh, that the United States bombed, along with an ultimatum to Japan that they had three days to surrender or we would drop a second bomb. Um, and ultimately, of course, we did because the Japanese uh, did not surrender. Uh, in total, almost 200,000 people died from the dropping of the two bombs. Uh, and that's both from the initial explosion or from radiation poisoning, um, which either killed or deformed thousands over in the following months. Um, and that's in addition to cancers caused by exposure to the radiation in survivors. Uh, and in many cases, uh, people that survived and went on to have children, uh, their DNA was damaged in such a way that many of their descendants also had um, physical disfigurations or um, were more prone to getting cancer. Uh, and so the, the atomic bombs kind of represent the, the full horror uh, that World War II had drenched the world in, and uh, let people ultimately, uh, it led to a lot of ethical questions afterwards, uh, how much is enough, um, and how many people are we willing to kill to achieve the ends. Um, so that, I guess, is something for us to think on. Um, Next, I'm just going to show some pictures uh, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki.
uh, after the explosions, and um, you're not going to see anything gory. But uh, these are images, and I think they're important. Um, one, because they're a physical reminder of the history, and just something to reflect on afterwards. Uh, and so what you can see in this picture is the shadow of somebody that died in the initial explosion. Uh, and because of some of the, the difference in temperature, really, um, the area behind this person um, their shadow is just burned into the concrete as a permanent reminder that there used to be a person there. And you can find these shadows all over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and this is another example, a man standing next to a building. You can see where the ladder was as well. Um, and images like this, as I said, are all over. Um, and I just think it's a really potent reminder of the things that happened in World War II. Uh, that's all for this lecture, and if you have any additional questions, as always, come see me in my office or after class. Thank you.